Welcome to our GDTA Spotlight session in March 2023. Uh, welcome all of you, and um, I hope you're doing well. My name is Uli Weinberg. I'm the director of the School of Design Thinking in Potsdam, in Germany, and uh, as uh, and I'm also have the pleasure to. Um, be the president of the Global Design Thinking Alliance. And uh, every month we gather here uh, for our GDTA Spotlight session. And today I'm really happy that we have two special guests from Ireland. Um, we have, um, as we chatted up front, we have the Briona, Briona team, actually. We have, <laughs> we have uh, Fiona chambers and uh, brian e Sappel, and they they call themselves the briona team and uh, because they are uh, actually running at the university college in cork in ireland the design thinking activities and uh, they call their talk today art thinking and design thinking at the university or in university college cork and they call it also an innovation marriage made in heaven. So I'm, uh, I met Fiona uh, like, uh, quite a while ago, uh, uh, first time. I think I'm not sure if we if we uh, run across while while you were at the HBI in Potsdam, uh, but uh, I think it was a little bit later. Um, and uh, I was really impressed by the activities, by the design thinking, the global design thinking activities. Uh, Fiona was um, driving at that time. Um, and she was so dedicated uh, with their activities, with her activities and the activities of the University College in Cork that uh, we finally were saying, we, you need to join the GDTA, you need to be part of that with your activities. And uh, we want to, um, since you are doing global things um, anyway, and the Global Design Thinking Alliance is trying to support that. So if you, you could be, who could be another uh, could be a better member um, than the University College of Cork. And uh, so we, I'm really pleased to have uh, the two of you here today. Fiona Chambers, the senior lecturer in physical education and sports peda pedagogy, pedagogy at the University College, and, and uh, Brian e. Supple, senior lecturer in design thinking uh, pedagogy and practice praxis at University College. And both, uh, yeah, you both will talk about your experiences. And the the whole hour uh, is always set up uh, as a 60-minute activity, our Global Design Thinking, uh, the GDTA Spotlight session. And uh, uh, so they will talk about the both, uh, both of you, you are planning to talk about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more. And then the floor is open. We always keep it also as an open Zoom call. So um during the presentation i would love that we all switch off our video and also our audio so that we just see the the uh, the two presenters and uh, but after that uh, we would be very happy to see all the faces and to get you involved in a discussion and uh, question and answers feel free to also put questions already in the chat if you like if you have some ideas uh, and we try to uh, use the last um, the last half hour uh, to discuss and we record uh, all the sessions uh, at least the 60 minutes and uh, you will have the chance also to look to look it up later at the gdta.org website um, gdta global design thinking alliance is now a little bit more than five years old and we have i think right now steffi correct me it's uh, 32 members in five continents i think in 16 countries and um, i'm really really happy and actually in ireland we have uh, we have three member institutions which is very unusual in germany we have two member institutions the country with the most member institutions currently is actually india with four institutions and uh, so it's it's a really growing network and i'm very happy about that about the uh, the resonance we are seeing uh, globally. But now let's give the stage to the Briona team, to Dr. Fiona Chambers and Dr. Brownie Supple. And uh, please give them a big hand. And thanks for joining us here. The stage is yours. 
Thank you so much, Uli. I really appreciate the introduction. So um, we're going to get started with Team Briona's uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk first and then uh, Bryony will, will uh, start uh, following on from that and just share some in more insights into, into what we're doing. So I hope that everybody can see the screen. Just put your thumbs up. Hopefully that's the case that yes, I can see thumbs up. Thank you, Bryony. Yes. Um, so you've heard the topic for conversation, but I'm actually going to bring you to New York for my first, um, I suppose, uh, piece of this. So it's March 1898 in New York, and there's an international delegation walking down the street, very like this street here. It's a spring day. It's just stopped raining. And there's a cross sweeper pushing piles of horse dung out of the way. The stench is unbearable and the sound of horse hooves and carriage wheels is deafening. They enter a building and there's a sign over the door, the first International Urban Planning Conference, 1898. Now we know from the records of that International Urban Planning meeting that their conversation was not about housing, was not about public spaces. It was all about horse dung. You can see it on the street there, piles of it. They were so focused on the horrendous horse dung problem that basically the only thing that they seemed to need to focus on was that problem. And the prediction was that by 1930, that it would be up to the third floor windows in New York, and that by 1950, if the problem continued in London, it would be three meters high. So it would be a major health and well-being and safety issue across the world in every city, really. But interestingly, the question is if they had only been more curious they might have heard about something a bit more exciting than moving horse dung around the street and getting it off there. It was actually this amazing invention that had happened 10 years prior to that. And that was done by Carl Friedrich Benz in 1886. And it was the car, the very first car, and it was ready for public use. We, we basically, the message here is that by asking different questions, they could have actually surfaced that opportunity. And instead of looking at themselves knee deep in horse dung, they could have been looking outward to say, OK, what is the problem we're facing here? What are the solutions? But probably more importantly, where are the possibilities? OK, and in terms of what we do in in the strategic design at UCC, we embrace both art thinking and design thinking to give us that power to recognize the now. OK, we, we recognize what's around us but we're always looking to the future. And how we do that is through both art thinking and design thinking. So this is from Ars Electronica Future Lab, and they talk about art thinking and design thinking juxtaposed here. And art thinking is really about creative questions. So it's a vision and a philosophy, and it's always about having the antenna up to see where are the new directions? What signals are there? Um, and where are the new possibilities for the future? With design thinking, it tends to be about creative solutions, focusing on an end user or human centered um, issues. And it does try to understand the possibilities, but then to utilize the possibilities. So effectively design thinking is about the creative solutions part of it. Whitaker in her book in 2016, spoke about design thinking and about how it was about user centric approaches to anchor solutions in more prosaic and incremental territory. Whereas art thinking was this really amazing opportunity to liberate practitioners from the user experience and to offer way more creative, radical and disruptive options. And we feel in, in strategic design at University College Cork that this is actually a very powerful double act. If you bring art thinking and design thinking together, they provide a really novel way of looking at the world around us. So what we've done is we fused them into a new paradigm, a new dual paradigm. And for us to be that bold, to call it a paradigm, there's actually three different things it needs to have. It has to have a worldview, it has to have a way of reasoning, and it has to have a truth criteria. So for us, the wicked problem remains the worldview, regardless whether it's art thinking or design thinking. The reasoning is always going to be abductive. So it's about this empirically tested, qualified guesses, which fit across both. Um, and it's an iterative process, as we know, during abductive reasoning. So it's about 
suggesting. It's about doing that through visualizations, mock-ups, prototypes, and then evaluating what's happening. And then finally, the third element, which is your truth criteria, is about this meaning making. And certainly when you cross the design thinking, art thinking divide, we're talking about creating new artifacts that make sense in their context, context but they're also, uh, they make sense in the now and into the future, if you get me. So it brings you, the beauty of mixing these two things together is it brings you from the now to the future. And that gives it an extra, um, just an extra, extra special something. So this dual paradigm for us is infused all the way across the mindset, the process that we use, and we use the HPI process, and also the learning spaces. And that's something that Bryony um, is very much involved in. So the learning spaces in which design thinking and art thinking occur, and that happens all the way through our innovation work. So how do we do that? So how do we bring this paradigm to life? Well, we've been using for, for the last number of years um, this approach called a D-cubed model of innovation praxis. And that was developed by my colleague, Dave Salmon, and myself in 2020. And it actually, we were told afterwards that it was the, the edge. It was that piece um, that the government liked so much that they gave us, to, the, to date, they've given us 2.25 million to run a particular program in University College Cork in innovation. So they liked this model so much, they thought, okay, you're onto something, you're doing something very different. So this particular model has three fluency bubbles, we call them, design, digital, and data. Fluency in this case simply means critical engagement, okay? So it's not cursory, it's not surface, it's about a very deep questioning and critical attitude in each of these. And what we do is we, we can see the dual paradigm of art thinking and design thinking in every single one of these bubbles. And I'm just going to now unpack every one of the bubbles so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So if we unpack the design fluency bubble, there are three aspects. And you're going to see as I move through them, there's a dance. It's like a dance between design thinking and art thinking in every one of them. So the first one is creation or maker fluency which is a deep understanding of how to create and leverage knowledge to make something new. And that can be in the, the virtual world, the physical world, or I could say digital world, which is a combination of both. Next, we have curiosity, and that's very much embedded. It's, it's all about the power of the question and, and asking the, I would say, the right questions and not being afraid to keep laboring and asking questions. But then more than that, trying to, to answer those questions as you move through. So just not leaving everything always open-ended. In terms of the innovation aspect of it, it includes the realization that it's okay to fail. And that's something that we're very comfortable with. We iterate forward, we learn, and it's just a, a particular kind of way of looking at the world, which is, is very paradigmatic. In the next bubble, the digital fluency bubble, we're going to see how technology has switched to being something that we are kind of mesmerized by as humans to something that's going to actually serve us. So it's very much aligned with the new Society 5.0, the Japanese concept of Society 5.0, where technology now is serving um, human, humans and the betterment of the lives of humans on the planet. So it's basically um, harnessed here, the digital fluency to try and innovate but also to help us to tell stories of innovation. And importantly, it's going to encourage criticality and responsibility when engaging with digital tools. So these are the three elements. We leverage technology. So humans are going to leverage technology to create new knowledge, new challenges, new problems. And we always complement this with critical thinking, complex problem solving, and social intelligence to try and solve these new challenges. We try to get the message out there and to try and tell our stories using excellent communication skills. And we are of the moment in terms of what they look like. And they they basically attend to all of those uh, digital generations that are uh, with us now from literally builders, baby boomers, all the way through to Generation Alpha, uh, who were born in 2010 and uh, Generation Beta, who will be born in 2025. So it's really important to harness technology to tell our story as well. 
And then the final bit, I think, is actually most important. It's this concept of um, being digitally fluent. And what that means is not using technology for technology's sake, but being able to critically engage with technology and to understand why I'm using it, who owns it, who owns my data, and um, where is this data going? And then how can I leverage the data to create fantastic solutions to serve humanity? Really, that's what that's about. So it's, it's a little bit beyond digital literacy, believe it or not. And the final bubble is basically this uh, capacity to use um, uh, data fluency. And essentially what that is about is it's not just about interpreting data. It's about trying to realize that data is the new oil. And when it's used effectively, it can really push us to the edge in our innovation. And it can bring us, um, if, if we look at the, at the exploration maps, it can actually bring us to the edge, to the radical dark side of innovation, if we can use our data um, well and, uh, and carefully and, and make sense of it. So it's, it's basically trying to really push the boundaries using this new oil, which is, is data, that flowing of data. So one aspect of our strategic design at UCC program is this postgraduate diploma that I spoke about earlier, which has received significant funding from the Irish government. And it harnesses a unique dual paradigm that I spoke about earlier of design thinking and art thinking using that three um, that, that D3 model, that D cubed model of innovation praxis. And I'll just show you now, one of our student groups actually innovated a social innovation which was about um, communities in, in Cork, basically, how they would better use uh, public facilities, uh, parks, et cetera, and that they would become more family friendly. And we ask the students here to actually um, to map onto our D-cubed model where they see um, their, their art thinking happening and their design thinking happening in each of the bubbles. And you can see there's quite a kaleidoscope of different approaches um, and they each of them have design thinking there but they also have um, an art thinking component to them so you can see the foresight study certainly has it use of lego thinking with your hands this idea of metaphor the idea of juxtaposing different things through scamper and um, just there's so many opportunities and this is just one example of one small project a community service project with one of our groups on our program that actually ran through this and was, was able to, um, to really shine a light, like an X-ray on the project to say, what's going on here? What are the meta things going on here in relation to the D-cubed model, but also in relation to, to art thinking and to design thinking? So that marks the end of my presentation. I just want to share with you some of the people who've influenced my thinking in this. And you can see some of the names there. Um, you can see Bruce Mao particularly jumping out there, his fabulous book Nexus, which I'm diving into at the moment, which aligns very nicely with some of the work here. And um, this is how you connect with me. I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, here's some very badly drawn art. <laughs> My colleague Bryony is now going to walk through how we engage in design thinking, art thinking paradigm in our program. So I'm just going to pass across to you, Bryony, um, now, if that's OK. Thanks, Fiona. And when I saw that image, I was like, I wonder, am I the person on the right with the, with the crazy hair? So I would identify it maybe with that person. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. So uh, bear with me one second. So I'm hoping you can see uh, a full screen there. Yep, perfect. OK, um, so sorry, I don't use Zoom that often so I'm just uh, clicking around a few buttons here to get everybody set up properly. So I, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to join um, Fiona to talk about uh, one of my passions anyway, which is, uh, well, well two I suppose, one of them being our postgraduate diploma in innovation through design thinking program, which Fiona has already um, uh, kind of highlighted to you. And secondly, is our artists in residence program, which is a, a key component of that, that we've, we've integrated as part of the, the diploma. And I suppose what I wanted to, to walk you through today is really um, a snapshot. You know, there, there's so much when I was looking at trying to condense all of this, um, it was very hard to, to, to concentrate because like I said, it's a real passion, but I suppose it's really, you know, thinking around the inspiration development and implementation 
of uh, the Artists in Residence program so far. Um, and I'm also giving credit to the wonderful artists that we're working with this year um, who are given on the screen there, Alex Pentek and Maya Thomas. And I'm gonna talk, trying to represent their, their work as well as I go through. So I wanted to start off with uh, talking about, uh, I suppose, an inspiration of mine. And we're going back even pre uh, me teaching on the postgraduate diploma in innovation through design thinking. Um, in my former life, I was working in teaching and learning. And I was always really struck by this idea of transdisciplinarity. And I love this idea of this, as it says on the screen here, this idea of co the collision of ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was always trying to bring that into my teaching, whether that was with making or creative approaches to um, learning and so on. And I was then very fortunate to have within my radar um, an introduction to artist Alex Pentek, who was based here in Cork um, and primarily works for the National Sculpture Factory. And Alex is very well known for um, sculptural pieces. So you can see here, there's an image of a piece that he has, which is installed in Washington, DC. And anyone who is from Cork or even from, from Ireland may have visited Middleton where he um, has quite a famous uh, sculpture called the Choctaw Monument, which is a, a monument to the Choctaw people. Um, I can't even go into the story or, or behind that, but it's an absolutely fascinating uh, story if you would like to get into the history of the, the connection with the Choctaw people. So as you can see, Alex is, is you know, a, a very established and uh, you know, um, talented artist to be working with. Um, but also his portfolio is, is really, I mean, when you talk about transdisciplinarity, this is an example that we shared with students a few years ago when we were looking at um, you know, different elements of inspiration. And this was an installation from 2021, where as you can see there, Alex has worked with um, a, a musician, Larissa Grady, who Larissa O'Grady, who's there on the left with the violin, and composer Sam Perkin. And what they were creating is this moving sculptural sound and skate performance. So they had three skateboarders. Um, you can see Alex is in the background there with the big wooden structure. And there was a video that he showed us in class where he is um, putting together this piece where he uses a, a, a kind of a, a structure to, to create the piece and then it comes down again. And it's really this idea of, you know, the skateboard is using that. I think he said it's probably one of the first time that a skateboard has been used as a musical instrument. So these, are, these um, sounds were captured. But you can see there as well, there's this kind of political piece it was after lockdown and this idea of public space, you know, is it private, is it commercial, who is con controlling it, it's this idea of the skateboarders kind of taking back ownership uh, and, and empowerment over the space. So I, I suppose, you know, that's Alex's um, background. As I said as well, he, his, his main, I, I suppose, um, approach in his art is using origami. Um, and again, in lockdown, we were keen to develop a, a, a again, this kind of transdisciplinary approach to um, inspiring people for their, their teaching, really. So we looked at this, this concept of origami and it was, we did an online uh, workshop where we were using origami as the tool really for teachers to think through how the process of engaging with origami folds was a point of reflection, uh, engagement, um, and even learning. So you can see there we had various elements of the workshop from describe to discuss. We had to do it online because we were in the, the kind of the peak of lockdown then at, the, at, at that time. But what we found then was even just engaging with origami, and as you can see, it's a particular kind of structural origami. It's not origami as you may think of it in terms of um, uh, you know, paper cranes and, and animals and so on. So it's more this structural type. Um, but what it meant was that we could, um, you know, we, we were then able to engage with um, teachers in terms of thinking about their teaching differently and almost putting them back into the, the, the shoes of learners as such. So as Fiona already mentioned, um, we, we use this as our point of inspiration, which is this idea of uh, art thinking and design thinking. Um, and what I wanted to also share was this concept of art thinking as a compass. So again, this comes from uh, Ars Electronica Future Lab. Um, their concept really is this idea of art thinking uh, as a compass and design thinking as the process, as the way we go forward. 
So you can see here on the screen, we've got art as, an effective, as effective for observing the many possibilities and issues from a 360 degree perspective, art as a compass, um, and really this idea of, I love this quote, art thinking is not, a, is not a methodology, but an attitude, and it helps to open up our senses like artists. So as it says here, you know, we're not looking at this idea of art thinking and design thinking as different forces, but it's this idea of how we connect them and how we bring the inspiration um, from both. So then when, after I'd been working with Alex, um, I was keen then when I started working on the postgraduate diploma program of thinking then how we could maybe bring the ideas of art thinking into design thinking. And I then worked with Alex in terms of um, developing this artists and residence program. So you can see here, we've got the, the objectives of the artists in residence program um, are really to introduce students to a variety of creative, appro uh, creative approaches to problem solving. And I think really importantly here, expanding student notions of research beyond traditional uh, teaching norms, challenging student thinking regarding approaches to design thinking and beyond the parameters of business context. And also, I, I think this is really, really important as well, encouraging students to express themselves creatively. And very importantly, that this doesn't require an artistic um, background or skill level, but it's really about that, that mindset piece ultimately. So I just wanted to share um, a, a couple of examples of uh, one particular example, I think that really resonates with me um, regarding what Alex has, has done with our own students to date. And one of the sessions that I absolutely love that Alex does with our students is learning through failure. So our students do, um, you know, design thinking projects. There's often a lot of things happening within the projects, a lot of kind of competing demands and ideas, as we all know how design thinking works. Um, and it was really to get across this idea of, you know, failure can be a good thing. It's, it's, it's part of the process and getting away from that idea of, of, of the product, but what is the process, what is the learning journey, and what is the story that you're telling about that learning journey. And Alex um, did a session learning through failure, and he, he also credits the, um, the wonderful image on the screen to Monty Python, and I was like, I'm sold already. Um, but he was very kind of honest at the start of the session to say, I've actually never openly spoken about any of these things. You know, when I have an exhibition, I have the piece on show, but I haven't actually spoken about various failures that I've had. And he really, he was sharing with us things, for example, um, a, a paper sculpture that he put together, which had a, a, an amazing photo of him standing next to it. And he said, this is what it looked like. It didn't, in, it, the intention was not for it to look like that at all. And he showed us sketches of the idea that it was supposed to be this sphere shape, but ended up looking like this elongated tower. And he said, literally six hours before this showcase, I was, you know, tearing my hair up, panicking, the paper wouldn't hold, you know, there was moisture problems, um, you know, so he was really talking us through, you know, the, the, I suppose, lifting the lid behind that polished product piece. Um, and through a series of a, a few different failures that he'd had and how he came to understand those, he really then taught us all about these, I think, three key components that have just been absolutely vital when talking to our own students about their projects. And it's this idea of acceptance. So whatever happens within the project, it's accepting that. It's the non-reaction piece as well. And it's this non-attachment. And he talks about you are not your project. You know, you are not the thing that you're creating and having that, that uh, non-attachment. So I think it's almost this kind of Zen lessons that we have. But this almost kind of created a language then that we were able to really use and come back to with the students uh, to say, you know, remember that um, kind of, you know, if things feel like they're going a bit pear-shaped, remember what Alex was talking about. About. And again, they were blown away by this very accomplished artist saying that things had been failures or hadn't been funded. And, and indeed, we had a student return um, to do a presentation uh, from last year who, who returned to do a presentation this year to the students. And he actually talks about his Pentec learning moments, um, you know, regarding his project. So I think for me, that's a real win that we've managed to kind of get these ideas across to our students. So the second artist that we've had um, wonderful fortune to work with this year is Maya Thomas. So a very, very different approach um, that Maya has. So Maya, as you can see, he's just got this lovely um, graphic in terms of her, her own introduction. So she, uh, she does what she's calls uh, graphic harvesting. She's an illustrator. 
um, visual thinking. So this idea of communicating com complex ideas in, in uh, simple ways, play and free drawing. Um, she's very dedicated to, to sustainability, environmental, social justice, and so on. So you can see, <coughs> excuse me, a, a, an image here on the screen as well. This was a conference that I convened in 2019 in UCC where I had the pleasure of working with Maya first um, and she was working as our graphic harvester for the conference. So you can see an image there behind us on the wall that she was working on uh, live capturing the main ideas from the conference. So what we've done uh, as part of her artists in residence um, inclusion is she's worked with us, for example, this is a, a sample of how she came in and what she's produced here is actually on an iPad. So it's just amazing what she's able to do virtually. Um, but the, the, the students were doing presentations on hackathons uh, one of the weeks uh, this semester, last semester, and she sketched the main ideas from those. So again, it was a really kind of an interesting reflective moment for the students to be able to go back to the, their own content, but that was um, being communicated in a completely different way to what they'd um, done themselves. Uh, and, you know, even in terms of looking at each other's presentations as well and, and the different elements that came out of, of those. Um, so really talented in what she's able to do. Um, and one of the sessions that, that Maya has done with our students as well is this idea of visualising information. So again, how do you get complex ideas across simply, but also how do you take the fear out of thinking, I can't draw? Um, and that's what we've, we've really also been trying to um, encourage with the students, you know, even for example, when they're doing design sprints, how do you get certain concepts across or take notes quickly? And having something as, as simple as um, a, a skill in sketching can be a really fast track way to enable that. Um, so Maya also put together then uh, this, uh, I suppose, gives you a summary of the artists and residents program itself. Um, and you can see there she's captured various elements such as um, what is the artist in residence. You can see there's nods there to Ars Electronica, as we've spoken about, as well as um, Krebs cycle of creativity, which is uh, the Nuri Oxman model. Um, there's elements of the, the learning outcomes and the, the student testimonials, I think, really speak to, I think, the impact of what we're trying to achieve. So students talking about, you know, this observation piece. So there's many, many ways to look at a problem. And again, that's what we're trying to get across with our design thinking program. And as Fiona said at the start with the dung, you know, there's various ways of looking at problems. So the art thinking lens really enables that for students and that observation piece. Um, also, this idea of distraction, so, um, you know, getting students out of their heads, the project can be really, really intense, so enabling this kind of creative piece where students can, it's almost this mindfulness piece, and again, that's the feedback that we got certainly with um, Alex's origami folding as well, that kind of slowing down and switching off element. Um, there's a real sense of generosity from the artists. And I love this quote, I feel I am a better designer for having met and worked with the artists. And I think certainly we've also asked the students to um, uh, integrate their reflections around the artist in residence program in parts of their assessments. And it's really amazing to see the, the um, how it's inspired uh, maybe a kind of a dormant creativity in themselves. Uh, it's maybe sparked or reignited um, other, you know, creative interests that perhaps people had put aside. And that also came to light, or this idea of, I'm not creative. I never thought I was creative, but then I engaged in the artists in residence and I have started to untap this, you know, this fascination now with origami or with sketching. Um, so I just wanted to end, I suppose, with a, a couple of um, uh, publications that we have, um, which will, what, this first one is forthcoming. So this is a book chapter that I've written with Alex and a couple of other uh, colleagues, one of whom is also a, uh, a lecturer in UCC in, uh, in engineering. And we've looked at this idea of paper as teacher. So again, this, this um, I suppose, the potential of the process of origami and engaging in origami and reflection and, and what that can teach us about ourselves as educators and also as, as learners. Um, and this is another paper that um, we wrote, again, the same authors, and this was published in the All Island Journal of Higher Education uh, with a similar kind of a, a theme looking at um, the application of origami. Okay, that's my whistle stop tour. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear questions and uh, 
engage in some discussion now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, and also Bryony, uh, for your uh, uh, very interesting uh, <clears throat> insights in, in your work. Actually, um, um, I, I, I like the um, I like the uh, the way how you um, integrate um, special special art um, experiences in the uh, in the design thinking process and actually try to combine it. Uh, for uh, if I look at how we frame design thinking at uh, at the HPI, uh, uh, we we somehow integrate it for, for us. You know, we, we we always treat it since we are not in in a in a, in a design department or in a design school or art school, we are in an IT school. So for us, art was always uh, a in, an integral part of the design thinking uh, teams, the, the whole team structure. So I don't see uh, uh, right now. So uh, please, uh, uh, the question to the audience, um, uh, please think of, of any um, any comments and questions to our both uh, speakers here? Um, I have. Um, I, I, will, I will start with uh, with a question. Um, <clears throat> I um, I was uh, so you uh, and, and that is re regarding the um, the the team aspect of design thinking. So you were talking about, and that that is for me that is a critical issue if you are talking about art and uh, art thinking and design thinking. Uh, so I would frame that in a way that I would say, so the art thinking is more the thinking of the individual creator and design thinking is more the creativity of a team, which is not necessarily uh, a, a kind of a, a born creator. Uh, so, somehow. Yeah. So, and, and how do you frame that? What, what, how do you see the, um uh, the uh, the the team aspect uh, reflected in maybe both you know maybe i i i have wrong perception of that i think that's a really interesting observation Oli. um I, I think you're right you know I, like part, like i was saying with the the integration of the the reflections that's that's an individual assessment that the students do whereas the group projects are you know they're their individuals coming together to solve a, a challenge. So I suppose the, the assumption is that they're bringing the individual learning elements to that group challenge piece. But I think that's a really interesting point that I'd like to reflect on a little bit more, I think in terms of that, that group piece, I think that's a really interesting observation. And I, I also just to add to what Brian is saying, I mean, I'd love to explore it more because I do think there's a collective art thinking going on as well. So you certainly have this kind of individual approach and you're igniting and opening up the mind to look at things a little bit differently. And that's highly introspective, I would say. But then there, there is something where when they come together, I, I, I think you've put something very interesting on the table. Definitely. So we're going to yes. think about that. <laughs> Thank yes. you for that. It's really good. Yeah. Andre. Yes. Yes. I, see I may share my 50 cent because that's just what I'm tracking right now. Um, the connection between arts, which you represent, and science, which I represent because I'm a physics professor on how sciencey can you get. And uh, still, we both feel very comfortable in the design thinking process right at home and communicate with each other and can do joint uh, solutions. I guess that's a really big thing that design thinking gave uh, humanity, don't stop sooner, um, bringing things together that commonly viewed do not fit together. Now let me sh shortly sh um, share what I'm uh, right now uh, I'm talking about. You perhaps know this uh, idea um, of uh, being first, have so many ideas and approaches as possible, which is a creative thing and really, a, yes, an artsy thing, I would say so. And then um, bringing it down to things that you can actually produce, that you can actually create. Perhaps that's still art uh, then. And where I am as a physicist um, completely at home is, 
in this uh, thing of prototype test, prototype test, if I conduct an experiment, say I want to find the Higgs boson or whatever, that's what I do. I tickle around until it <laughs> goddamn works. That's what I'm trained at. And uh, design thinking, as you can see in the process, is sort of a connection of these both worlds. And I thought um, for all my life, okay, there are people which do the left part and there are people which do the right part. And now we are meeting at places like the HBI to um, communicate until I stumbled into the research of neuroscientists like Gundula Seidel, for example. And with uh, brain research, I figured out that the human brain works exactly that way, but on the full scale. So um, if you um, bring some high achiva, some mathematic gifted child, you know, child a complex task, um, you see how the high achieving kid, the brain really fires like a Christmas tree. A lot of different solutions like mental rotation. That's the question, uh, how many diagonals has a uh, 33 cornered thingy? Um, I can't do it um, in my brain alone. I would mentally rotate something like this, and I would look for analogies and rules of thumb. And human and highly gifted people do just write this. The anterior brain is searching for questions unconsciously. And then this um, more science part in the forebrain kicks in and says, okay, that's a good path. So now, you have the mathematician who has an idea, doesn't know where it comes from, inspiration, has an idea, and tries to make it work. But the human brain originally does, does all of this to come to good ideas. And so one theory of me, uh, mine is that we have in design thinking found a process which actually accurately models the process of a creative human brain. So it's a way to make humans creative and intelligent. and Best part of it, uh, it makes it in a transparent way with this process so that you can couple a lot of people to work together. So um, creativity and intelligence uh, on a collaborative scale, that is right now my theory, what design thinking is and what makes it so worthwhile and so well functioning. I, I think that's such an interesting point, Andre, and I, I'm just going to share something back at you now as well. Um, and it, it, it speaks to um, somebody who Fiona mentioned earlier, Bruce Mao. Um, but this is something I think that you've just spoken to here is this idea of design yes. going across all of the elements that we're looking at. And I, I just love how they've looked at these elements of, um, I don't know if you can say that properly, but uh, discover, and invent, create, and this left brain, right brain piece. And mm -hmm. I think that's really where we're trying to situate ourselves. And like you said, it's like design thinking provides us that, yep. that language and that mechanism. And that's actually what I'm finding as well, because as I mentioned, I'm working with a senior lecturer in engineering. Now I know nothing about engineering. I'm probably the least scientific person that you can come across. And yet we're working together. We got funded just recently to develop a transdisciplinary module that's looking at origami, robotics and engineering, but also design thinking, aesthetics and philosophy and bringing those all together to try and educate people around, again, this kind of collision of ideas and cool. what has been the common factor for us. We had a planning meeting yesterday has been the language of design, because like you said, Guangbo, the engineer is saying, yes, we prototype and we do this and we iterate. I was like, that's my language. I understand that. Don't tell me about the, the, the bridges falling down or the angles or, you know, whatever the formulas. But I, that's what I that's what speaks to me. So I think I think you've you've articulated something really interesting there, Andre. So great! Thank you for um, sharing this with me. Uh, again, usually they say there is not a pill that can make a human being intelligent, uh, but you know your surrounding forms, and we have a possibility to take somebody and plug it in in a team of people and um, so intelligence may spread from one brain to the other and that for a neuroscientist and for a pedagogic and i'm both of this and a physics professor too that is really a, a gift to humanity yeah no, nothing less of this yeah great discussion yeah thanks thanks that is actually why why i called why i titled my book uh, five years ago 
network thinking and not design thinking mm -hmm. um because i'm i've what i see in a in a team when when we have this kind of four four five six people from their very different disciplines it's they are generating a kind of holistic view and a, and some kind of human supercomputer so like yeah you have all of a sudden you you, you have not just five brains added together uh, it is actually they are multiplying their their activities somehow uh, and it's not only the brains it's actually the full human um, is is there and that is that is what i find through the past fund through the past five 15, 15 years so i'm i'm running the d school now here that is what i found so interesting that that the, the, this to see that happen with people physically and i'm just we, we just had a uh, uh, a five-day, the Global Design Thinking Week just finished yesterday uh, with about 50 people from 16 different countries from so many different disciplines uh, physically getting together after the pandemic, first time after three years now. Um, and uh, it was so interesting to see the this kind of sparkles, this kind of sparkling things happening when people get together and start working one one challenge together you know and, and put their brains together and then come up with prototypes and 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 run through the process even if just they just had one week so it's that is um that is what um, yeah thanks andre for for adding that uh, kind of neuro neuroscience um, aspect to that other yes. questions are there well, questions could, and could remarks I... I was Fiona, just, yeah. Can I just add? I'm just going to add in, and actually, I had that image ready as well. So that's so funny. Briona is alive and well. That's great. <laughs> so what I was going to bring up was the. It's what you just said, um, Uli, when you're talking about people coming together. Um, now in this case, what we did is we we decided to take this on tour on our campus, and what I, what I might do just this is a couple of short little sharing things. We decided to bring design thinking, art thinking out into the campus to a, a topic that really mattered to the campus. Um, and that particular topic, I'm just going to share my screen, just two seconds, make sure I've got that. And literally, I'll just, please indulge me just for two seconds. We basically decided that we were going to um, deal with something which is really annoying on campus, which is the plagiarism issue. And what we did was we created a pop up inside in the library that was um, basically it's called Cupid because it happened on Valentine's Day and it was connected university policy, innovation and design. And what we did was people as they walked in, we asked them, do you have five minutes? Do you have you know 10 minutes? Do you have 60 minutes? How many minutes do you have to give us? And on the basis of that, we actually gave them a number of tasks to do. And um, so I'll just show you a picture of the love thing that was going on. So they had an opportunity to engage, obviously, like different sides of the brain and what they were being asked to do. But ultimately, they they walked through a pathway if they had 60, 75 minutes to, to go through with us, where they actually created visual artifacts at the end of the actual process. So it was a really, really interesting one. So this 60 minute task was where they had to use a series of design sprints to build an artifact that would matter. So it was like a pocket policy for the university. So this, this became a very, I would say, meaningful exercise for the university. And we used our art thinking, design thinking processes to get them to that point, to create a pocket policy that could be used by any student or staff member on campus. And we decided to do something a bit theatrical a bit arty in, in our library space to try and capture um, that particular attention. Um, so it's this is happening in our program, outside our program. Um, we just bring it on tour. It's on a roadshow. You just bring it wherever you need to bring it. And whoever arrives, arrives. And then you have that gorgeous melting of intelligences and ideas and mindsets and disciplines because it's a university. Sounds very good. Sounds Sounds very, very good. And do do um, do the students accept that? Do they jump um, um, jump on that on your uh, on that kind of experience, well, or do you have it, to encourage this, them? We have to entice. So that's why we did five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Will you engage with the hundred and ten policies that we have on campus? Small little uh, exercise. Okay. Do you have a few more minutes? So they don't grab it. They're a bit kind of going. What is that? 
we on that particular day we had sweets lollipops candy whatever you call it we had those enticements lots of bribery and then you just build them towards will you stay with us for an hour and actually build something cool so it was kind of I thought psychologically a little bit clever to try and pull them along that pathway and um, and then entice them into something bigger uh, like a design thinking workshop so we run um, the ideas for impact workshops a number of times during the year so that's that's almost our shop window for those types of events as well so it's kind of a, a double a double kind of purpose and I, I think Uli your question again is really interesting because um, I think that's probably the the reality behind the scenes of the artists and residents as well because not everybody loved it you know the reality was people were like what is this what are you making me do why, why are we doing this isn't this a waste of my time I need to do my project so I, I think as well it's um you know it it, it, we, it was almost like this expression of it was like marmite like you either loved it or hated it but for me that was that was actually a, a kind of a win because we wanted to provoke we wanted to say we wanted to use it as a point of reflection and say to students, well, what is it, what is it about this then that's not gelling with you? If, you? if you hate it, what is this element that, you know, does it bring back memories from when you were doing art at school as a kid and you were told that you were bad or whatever? So again, it, it was, we found then if the way that we we're able to bring it through the individual assessment piece allowed that space for people to really think through that very honestly um, because you're right, Uli, it won't, it won't land with everybody. But that's okay, I think, because that's what we're also trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to provoke people as well, I think, through this. Yeah. Yeah, actually, what, uh, what we decided when we started the D-School in Potsdam, we were thinking about, shall we push people? Also, our, the students at HPI, which are IT students, shall... Are, are they obliged to take a course and we we stayed away from that we were saying no let's let's actually stay in a pull mode and and stay open for everyone who is interested who who comes up to us and he he or she finds it interesting um and it's a probably a different situation at, at your university because at our at our institute the hpi they're all it students so it's just one discipline we had to open up to other universities and and had to had to widen the the floor um, and that worked quite well right now after 15 years I, I think um I, I I think we have to get more into a push mode actually to get more people involved not only not only at university but actually more in in general to make people think that um, complex problem solving uh, is really best done with a design thinking process and a design thinking environment and lots of people are completely not experienced with that and i th i think uh, to make people aware there are new ways of solving problems and um, especially in a world we are living in with uh, technology moving very very fast forward we even didn't touch the ground uh, with art uh, with artificially uh, generated arts, and, and that is a topic I think that will um, the will come in pretty soon with Dolly and uh, Mid Journey and all those uh, things. We are actually testing at the D School, trying trying also to find out um, if there is uh, artificial intelligence as a as a new team member. So we have a little research program running on that, um, trying to find out what is. Uh, what kind of role can AI play in the in the future? Also, in the collaboration process uh, between humans, you know, and uh, I think that is another topic we could spend another uh, another GDTA spotlight session on, and we probably will. Um, but uh, um, that is for, for me. It's um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to to learn um, how you are. Also with origami, I like it with with uh, all different approaches to bring people into the situation that they are not that they that they discover their their creative their individual creative power and then giving them a chance to connect this these powers with the with the power of others. Any other question from um, other like Joanne or Linda? Some comment. 
comment uh, or Mats. Actually, there's no question I have to ask David Di Gregorio. Uh, I'm interested in your setting. Is that a is that a live? Are you really sitting at a table, or is that is that a virtual set? Is that a virtual table you're you're sitting at? Because it looks a little bit artificial. <laughs> this is real. It um, is real. I'm, okay. I'm in a very okay. nice room off of our. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah. on, in a very nice room off of our a wonderful library media center, and uh, it's called the Cyber Cafe. It's for faculty. And uh, uh, actually, our principal uh, joined us for a few minutes. He had to go somewhere. Uh, but I find this whole talk fascinating. I hear um, a lot of um, logic, and I also see uh, a lot of emotion. And I think that the, and that's what intrigued me about the title of this conference. It seems to bring logic and emotion beautifully together. Uh, so to make for better outcomes, um, I think, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, if design thinking is a very logical process. And sometimes art, there's a little illogic there and a little something else. And it just seems when they're both together, it makes for uh, makes for something beautiful, aesthetic. Yeah. I think that on the, on the first glance, it looks like a logical process. Um, but uh, as soon as five or six people are using that process, you have that piece of art involved immediately. So you have that kind of randomness. You have that that uh, all of a sudden that those surprises, uh, which are which can be called we could call that art, you know. But you could also call it just a, um, a happening by accident or whatever. Uh, when I looked at the at the presentations I saw yesterday with our students, um, I think none of them would have claimed their presentation to be a piece of art. But looking at it sometimes at, at the performance, at their, let's say, their, their, their uh, scene play, uh, their theater performance, their, uh, just, and, and none of them was professional, professional um, uh, performer, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but that you could have as an out, as an, as an external, you might have thought, wow, they're doing, they're practicing some, some art pieces. I think there's a, there's this very strong connectivity between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the 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 process connected with it with a with a team issue with a team engagement uh, and uh, times diversity you know uh, um, because we all we usually have highly diverse teams and and then you generate something which is not really completely logical and that is a great thing Joanne. You have, you have experiences in New York all the time. Joanne? I actually wanted to raise something. I wanted to ask something else that Uli, you mentioned, and Brian, if you, first of all, first, excellent presentation. I knew that already. I knew you too. <laughs> and I did nothing to had expected that anyway. Um, Fiona was in New York actually last week, and it was just amazing, really. I, so um, I wanted to ask, you know, Uli, you mentioned this, Fiona, and Brian, and, and all of you that are in the universities. Uh, this question of getting students involved in design thinking who might not be the typical candidates to do it. And maybe people could share what strategies you've used to get them excited about and interested. And we've seen at HPI, getting those IT students and doing design thinking, you're getting amazing startups out of that. And so I just wanted to you know, maybe raise that to, to, to everybody that's here. What are your strategies to get them involved and get them excited about it? Because they might not realize that they can. And as Brian and Fiona said, you're using all these different skills. And Andre as well. Andre, your colleagues were in New York too last week. <laughs> so I don't know, Fiona. Do you want to jump in there? I, yeah. I, well, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I will. But but it's it's like you. This sounds mad now, but sometimes you don't call it design thinking because sometimes it puts people. They have a particular view of it. So you, you, you center it on an issue that seems to matter on our campus or wherever, and you pull them around that and say, can you help us with this? We just want to figure it out. And you then you feed it in. It's like a Trojan horse, because for some on campus, they're a bit jaundiced by the term and we have to be careful how we manage it. Once they're in the room, we have them. We know we have them because it's like 
we just share a story. We were we were working with another university on their st strategy with their C-suite. And um, they arrived in and there was one man and he was perfect in his suit and his tie and all the rest of it. And we thought, oh, God, oh, right. OK, what's this going to be like? I wonder how he's going to take to what we were doing. And then Brian, he pulled out all the Lego and he literally opened the bag of Lego with his teeth. He was that excited. And off he went, sleeves up, tie off. And then we were in. So I think it's the pedagogy that we use. We grab them and it's very compelling because we as design thinkers can explain why we're doing every aspect. That's the key, actually. A lot of the time you're, you're bridging your right brain, left brain there by why. Why are we doing this? What's why is it important? What's the you know, just the, the why would you bother spending all this time on this to get to here? So that kind of a really and feeding it in nicely not not laboring it but just kind of saying oh this is why we try this out and we want to try this now because that didn't work or whatever you know being very honest and humble uh designer humility when it comes to that as a facilitator yeah so that's me that's my top is worth brian you probably have something else i'd say no i was going to say very similarly like i think if you're if people are coming with a problem to solve, then I think you've got them. Where And like Fiona said, you don't frame that as design thinking, but you're like, do you have a major problem that you'd like to solve? Then let's solve it together. And then you, you, you're introducing all these methods and ways of thinking about the problem. And I think that's what we find with our program as well, that the students by the end, I mean, it's really profound what the students say. Like I've been teaching for over 20 years and always at the end of programs, you know, students would be like, that was a great course, really enjoyed it. The, this this cohort, the last three years, unlike, unlike any other program I've taught, they'll be at the end of the program saying, this course has actually changed my life. It's changed, it's literally changed how I look at things. It's changed my, my prospects of my career, what I thought was possible for me. And I, I think there's, there, that's, that's the magic. And like, like we're saying, people can be sometimes a little bit turned off by the frame, the framing of it, or, oh, that's for business. I, I'm not from a business background. Whereas everybody has a problem that they want to solve. And everybody, by and large, a lot of people have something that they're passionate about that they want to solve. And I think that's, that's really when you get them by the heart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. That is also, that is also what, what I'm seeing. Um, and what keeps me at the D school since lots of years is that people are at the end of the semester are, are so excited about what it did to their brain and to their activities and to their future and seeing also so many companies falling out of the program. So such kind of um, enthusiasm to start companies, to start organizations, to start something. It's really great. But we are a little bit over time for the official part. Actually, I would like to officially now and our session and david uh, if you keep your hands up uh, your hand up we'll we'll get to you later back to you later but uh, thanks a lot to uh, our uh, fabulous uh, briona team um uh, bryony and fiona uh, from uh, from university college uh, cork for your presentation and for your connecting the art world with the design thinking world thanks a lot thanks.